welcome to Learning Music with Pat. I have been talking to you about how to hold an instrument, how to play an instrument, the position of your hands, and the notes and so forth of this instrument. But what I want to do first is I'm going to play a song. This is a song that just came to me, so I wrote it up. And I want to teach something from it, to tell you something from it. So I'm going to start. There's no background tape for this. It's just going to be me playing it singly. And this is the way it goes. Now the song is short, it's kind of uplifting, and I played it with just six notes, that's all, just six notes. So the notes that I'm trying to teach you to play, I'm not going to teach you the octaves yet, I'm not going to go to the highest note or even the lowest note, which is really kind of hard to get sometimes, but the main notes. Those are the main notes of the uh, of the uh, recorder. Now an octave has eight notes, and the eighth note is a repeat of the first note. I'm telling you and I'm teaching you about the main notes of the recorder, and I played this piece with just six notes. And I just did it particularly to show you that you don't have to know a whole lot in terms of the notes, the, me the, the number of notes that you can play in order to play music in order to create music, and I just wanted to demonstrate that fact. Well, I also want to go next to talk to you about instruction booklets. When you first start to learn how to play, you'll be given an instruction booklet, and I have a couple of here that I want to show to you. This is a flute. It's called the Standard of Excellence. Now, I've used Standards of Excellence for many different types of instruments. They write them for many types of instruments, but this happens to be for the flute. And what an, an instruction booklet will do, and I'll open this up and show you. First of all, it shows you how to hold the instrument, how to place your mouth on the instrument, and any, any instruction book will do the same, where you place your hands. And then when you get to the point where you're learning actual notes, you'll be getting one note at a time. And in the upper left and the upper right hand corner, it'll show you the note, it'll show you where it's positioned on the staff, it'll show you how to finger it, and then you'll be playing that one note. And usually for flutes or saxophones, it's going to be a note that's really simple to play, and it's going to be a note that's going to help you balance the instrument. I know a lot of times on flutes, what they'll show you is a B flat or something, because that helps to balance the instrument. You have one finger on each hand that's helping to balance the instrument. So let me show this to you just a little bit longer. And at the end, what they give you is something called a fingering chart. And the fingering chart is important in that it shows you how to finger every single note that the instrument can play. Well, I've missed this. It's not on the last page at all. But you do have fingering charts. And I know it's in here, but I can't seem to find it. So I'm going to skip this and go to the recorder book. This is one of the books for the recorder. And it does the same thing. You open the book. It tells you, it gives you a sketch of the instrument. It gives you the, the uh, note that you're playing. It gives you the fingering of what you're playing. And then you play that one note. It's like every lesson, there's a new note. And then at the end of it, is a fingering chart. And this is the fingering chart that they put in for the recorder. 
Now, the finger chat is important, as I said before, because it teaches you to play all of the notes of the instrument, sharps, flats, everything. But I know that um, uh, you need to understand that that's what it is. I had a friend of mine who was teaching herself how to play. And uh, she said, I'm playing this, I'm teaching myself. I knew what she was doing. This is the flute fingering chart. Um, what she was doing was uh, teaching herself how to play. And she says, I have this nice song. I really like this song. And it's very pretty. And I would like to uh, play it for you. And I said, well, bring it in. I'd like to hear it. And what she was doing, that she was playing the fingering chart. She did not realize that it wasn't a song. She looked at the fingering chart. Now, this is the one for the flute. So, we, and then you'll notice that the notes are out to the side because that's the way you hold the instrument. You hold the instrument out to the side to finger it so all of these notes are out to the side. This would be the thumb and the octave mechanism and these are the fingers uh, that you'd use for any particular note. Well, <clears throat> well, fingering chat is not a song. It tends to be like, um, Oh, it's, it's like a scale more than anything else. It gives you your notes, A, B, C, D, E, and then it fingers them for you, shows you how to finger it, and so forth. This is a fingering chart for the uh, recorder, and I took an, and added a keyboard to it so that if you have a certain note, the note is right here, and this includes sharps and flats, and then the fingerings for those notes are up and down because that's the way you hold the instrument and it shows the shots, it shows the flats and, uh, and if you want to you can see where it is on a keyboard so like this C is going to be right here this D is going to be right here, and it goes up for the two octaves, and this is a two octave keyboard. I always like to show a keyboard when I'm working with a student, so oftentimes I make my own fingering charts. I do that because I really want the student to understand where it is on the piano. I'm not teaching them how to play piano. I'm not teaching them how to play keyboard, but if they're playing notes, I think it's important to know where those notes come from, and and how do those notes relate one to another? And you can see that easily on a keyboard. Most teachers don't do this. I always did this, but most teachers don't do it. You get the book, it shows you how to play the notes, you learn how to play the notes, you practice the notes, you practice the exercises, you play the music that it provides for you, and you're learning how to play. And there's no doubt when you get through, you know how to play the instrument with the instruction of the teacher to help you through it, because I don't I don't think anyone does that well if they just take a book, look at it, and say, well, I'm going to play this and that. Some people do better with it than others, but it's always nice to have somebody say, this is the way you really do it, this is the way it really sounds like, these are the fingerings that you really use, and it's nice to have somebody to kind of coach you, and I view myself as kind of a coach to help you to do that. But if you don't know, you just play anything, and you end up and not knowing what's a song what's not a song, what's an exercise, and you can get terribly, terribly mixed up. But I also like to show the students a keyboard because if I have a keyboard, I can say, yes, here's your C, your middle C, and your A is below that, and that's a third, and you can see it on this keyboard that it is actually a third. Now, if you're playing uh, guitar, or if you're playing violin, uh, or if you're playing some other instrument that you can get chords on, then you can play more than one note at the same time. Woodwinds can't do that. We can only play one note at a time, and that's also the same way as it is for the brass. But at least you can see what the relationship of the note is to another note. And I can say, okay, here's your C, here's your next C, here's your low C. So you have an octave, and there are two, there are actually three C's on this. It's a two octave, uh, two octave octave keyboard. Low C, uh, this is kind of, uh, I don't want to call it middle C because that has a meaning in itself that's a little different than what I'm trying to convey because middle C can also be low C. This would be low C, this is a higher C, and this is a high C. 
And so you see, these are the octave ranges. These are the range of the notes in between. And you can understand more what the music is and where it's coming from. So I want to show you some charts and help you to understand uh, about playing the instrument and how you do it. I made up my own fingering chart. This is a symbol that I use for a recorder. A little mouthpiece here, a little bell down there, and in between it you have the holes. Now usually nobody actually shows a real recorder. They symbolize it, and any of these holes are holes in which, if they're blackened, you have a finger on that hole. And if it's not blackened, then the hole is open and there are no fingers covering. So you have C right there, then B, A, G, F, E, D, and C. And what I have done is I have taken a little space and put where the, where the note is on the staff and have the fingerings for the note so you can see easily. This is the mouthpiece and this is the bottom of the instrument or the bell. And uh, this is where the note is on the staff. And those little dots beside, those are the thumb holes. They're either, either open or closed or half open, depending upon whether you're half holding. And at the bottom, I have the keyboard, so you know where it is on a keyboard if you, should use to, if you should choose to do that. A lot of people don't bother. I do when I'm teaching because, as I said before, I like to have students know the range. So how do you play? Let me pick up the instrument and review some things with you. This is one of my recorders. It's one of my my nicer ones, it's a Yamaha, always in pitch, I never have to worry about it. And I mentioned to you before in an earlier session how you put it together, the way that you put it together, and then you have the instrument, I'm assuming it's already together, and you've learned that, and then you know that you have to take your left hand on top and your right hand on the bottom. This is the same no matter what woodwind instrument that you're playing. The only instrument I've ever seen that doesn't do it that way and does it the opposite way is, a, is an instrument from the Middle East that you probably will never even see. I have it, but most of the instruments that, that we, you would even be bothering with, it's always left hand on top. And believe you me, I've seen people try to do the reverse. For them, they think think it's just as good, but you can't do it that way. Once you have your, your fingers in place, as I'm showing you, one finger over every hole, finger hole. Now you're not going to use all those finger holes for all those notes, so you, when you're playing it, you lift your fingers up so they're not touching, and, but it's, they're still kind of in a position so quickly you can move it. In your hands into the correct position. I know that uh, for piano students, they will be told, even if you're not using, let's say, the bass clef, even if you're not using all of the notes, keep your hands in position so that you can quickly move them to where they're supposed to be. And that's important because you don't have time a lot of times just to reach over across the keyboard to land your hand at the right spot. So once you have that, and then remember your thumb hole is going to be covered. This is used for octaves, but you can't get your notes without it. And then when you need an octave, you slide your thumb down a little bit. It's called half holing. And then you are able to push a note up into an octave, and that's how you get octaves on the recorder. It's not that hard to do. I'm not even taking the thumb off. When I want the higher pitch, I pull the instrument, I pull the finger down just a little bit. And that's just enough. You don't pull it down a lot, because if you pull it down a lot and you're barely covering the hole, you won't get the octave. You just need to move it a little tiny bit. So this is the right position. And if I were teaching you your first note, I would have you playing a B, and that's what most of the books do. A B is the first index finger and the thumb. 
and then you have your right hand on the back side of the instrument just for support and you can use your little finger to hold the front part of it. It's not going to affect the tone if you do that and that balances the instrument. It's important to know how to balance the instrument because if you don't know how to balance it, well then you're in trouble because the instrument can fall away from you and drop on the floor. And I've had students do that. They've tried to show me how to, because I'll ask them, how do you finger it? How do you hold it? Show me what you're doing. And they'll lose the instrument and it'll drop on the floor. So supposing I want to stop with that B, then I want to add another note. That's going to be the next one down. That's going to be an A. And the next one is going to be the G. And the next one will be on the right hand, because you're using just three fingers on top. The thumb is on the thumb hole, and the, the tiny finger, the little finger, really isn't doing anything. The F is going to start with the right hand. F, E, and D. That's almost the whole scale. That's six notes. A scale has, or an octave, has eight notes, and the eighth note repeats the first note. But I just want you to get this B, A, G, F, E, D. Now it's important to know where you place your mouth and how your teeth are on the mouthpiece. So just to pick it up and do that doesn't mean you're going to get very good sound out of it. You have to make sure when you put your mouthpiece into your mouth, this is called a fipple mouthpiece, put it up about a third of the way. Whatever is comfortable, but don't try to swallow it and put a lot of it in. And don't keep it just on the end either. It's kind of like a third of the way up to a half of the way up, whichever is comfortable. And you'll know what's right, because if you do it right, you'll get a nice tone out of it. And you put your teeth, your front teeth, on top of that mouthpiece. So you're actually putting your, when you put your lips down, they're in front of your teeth. Now for the lower lip, it's different. For the lower lip, you're gonna cover the lower teeth with your, with your uh, lower uh, lip. So that it's your lower lip that will be on the bottom, your teeth on top, the lower lip on the bottom, and then you're gonna squeeze in your side so you don't have air coming out the sides of the instrument. And when you do that, you get a nice tone, but you also have to tongue. When you tongue, you put your tongue up against your teeth because you can do that, even with the instrument in your, I say, well, you put your tongue actually up against the bottom of the mouthpiece and then release it. So your tongue is actually hitting the bottom of the mouthpiece, your teeth are on top, and it's as if you're saying ta, tu, ta, something like that. You don't say those audibly, but it's as if you were, because as soon as you strike the mouthpiece with your tongue, you pull back on it. If you kept it there, you wouldn't be able to get the note, so you pull back on it. play an awful lot. I only used four or five notes for that. So this is the way you do it. You pick it up. I'm just doing a little review because we just don't have too much time. I'll have to continue with this next time. Pick it up, hold it, left hand on top, right hand on the bottom. These are the only three fingers, these three fingers that you're going to use. 
except for the thumb, which is on top of the thumb hole. And then you see your right starts with your right index finger, and you have that B, A, G, F, E, D. And when I was teaching classes at a, at a school, I taught the kids, remember, the words are bag fed, B, A, G, bag, on the bottom, F, E, D. Then later on, I added the low C and the higher C, so you'll get a complete octave. Right now, I'm, I'm just trying to get those six main notes in. And then you've got to remember what you're going to do with your mouth. You stick the instrument in your mouth about a third of the way, teeth on top are on the mouthpiece, on the bottom, your lips are over your teeth, and it's your lips that hit the bottom. And then when you're playing it, you tongue by, by as if you were saying ta, ta, tu, or something like that. And so you get that ta out, and then you immediately withdraw your tongue, and then you can play all kinds of notes. And you have to put, you have to be careful how much air you put into it, because if you put too much air in it, you're going to squeal. You can't pull, put a lot in, but you have to put enough so the sound comes out very nicely. If you put too much air, you're going to get squealing sounds. If you don't put enough in, it's just going to be faint and weak. And without tonguing, you're not going to get clear sounds. So it's an awful lot to remember. But once you start learning how to play, it just comes so naturally you don't think about it. You don't pick up your instrument and say, okay, left hand on top, right hand on the bottom, and the mouth. You know, once you get used to it, you just pick it up and you play it. But you have to learn those basics first. If you don't learn those basics, you're not going to be playing or you're not going to be playing very well. Well, we will continue with this next time. I have a number of things to show you. So I'll just close it for now. Please join me next time.